Hey, honey, it's me. He could hear her sharp intake of breath. She knew something was wrong. He had left their small apartment barely 15 minutes earlier. Why aren't you at the interview? It's my old car again, hon. It conked out at the stoplight over here near the hospital. Sure is cold out here. Oh, no. How long until you have to be at the interview? Another 30 minutes. Well, I'll come pick you up then. We want you to get to that interview. His face reddened in the cold. They had moved to Atlanta six months after they both graduated from college. They decided to move in together over the objections of her old-fashioned parents. Things had not gone well. Their only furniture was two straight-back chairs and a small table. They slept on a mattress on the floor. Cheap sheeps from the dollar store. When he could bear it to admit it to himself, he knew she couldn't be happy. Nothing seemed to be going well for him. She had gotten a job on the first month they were there. She worked as a teller in a branch bank. She didn't like the job, but it was currently the only income they had. He didn't know what he wanted to do, and it frightened him. For the past few weeks, he had told her he was going to look for a job, and instead had gone to the public library and loitered in the lobby, reading newspapers from cities he'd never visited. I'm sorry, babe, he said into his phone. I know that this is the last thing that we needed. You just hang on. We have to get you to that interview. Okay, be careful. I'm in the parking lot right at the corner and you can't miss the car. He ran his fingers through his hair as he hung up. Maybe he should just call and postpone the interview. Just go home. No, he couldn't disappoint her. He had to go. Well, things have changed, he said aloud to no one in particular. He couldn't believe that he had ended up here, his prospects so dim. Just a few months before, he had been a big man on campus, respected by the other guys in the fraternity, the source of fun at parties, the center of attention wherever he went. Now, he was standing on a cold Atlanta street corner, his only worldly possession a broken down automobile, his only prospect an interview at a wholesale firm, the last place on earth he wanted to work. He stepped away from the curb and out onto the sidewalk so that she could see him easily. He saw a well-dressed young couple drive by in a shiny new car and averted his eyes. Look cool, he told himself. They probably have rich moms and dads. They don't know what it's like to have bad luck. Screw them. After a few minutes, he saw her, although she didn't see him yet. Her eyes weren't so good. She probably needed glasses, which they couldn't afford right away. She pulled into the hospital parking lot, jumping the curb slightly. She always did that. He heard the engine of her car running, labored. Her parents had bought that car for her high school graduation, he remembered. It wasn't running so well these days, though it was much newer than his bomb. He wondered how much longer before her car broke down, too. She looked pale in the early winter air as she stepped out of the car. He smiled and shrugged. The old car conked out on me, babe. Hell of a time for it to die. She smiled meekly. Well, don't worry now. We want you to get to that interview. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, look, don't worry about my car. We'll just leave it. I gotta get going. But what if it gets towed away? You know, we don't have the money to get it out of the impound now. It should be okay for a little while. This job is more important, right? Right. I guess you should get going. But what do you mean, I should, he asked. My mom called just after you did and said that she was on her way over. She wants to pick me up and go shopping with her. I told her how important this interview was for you. So you just take my car and she'll pick me up here in a few minutes. Her mother didn't like him and never had. He remembered fights they had early in their relationship when her mother had tried to break them up. He had won those arguments, but now he knew he couldn't argue. He swallowed a lump that had come up. He found that he just wanted to be gone before the woman showed up with a superior smirk on her face. Uh, okay. Well, I love you, babe. This is really great of you. She leaned over and kissed him. Her lips were cold from the wind. Good luck at your interview. Thanks. I'm going to knock him dead. Knock him dead for you, babe. She smiled that weak smile that turned his guts to jelly, the one he'd been seeing more and more lately and he got inside her warm car and left her standing there, the small, fragile person who rescued him day after day. A song came on the radio that took him back to a frat party two years earlier. That had been a great time, the best of times. 
he sang absently along as he pulled out of the parking lot. As he drove away, he looked back at her. She looked even smaller somehow, and he had a feeling, for a second, that he would never see her again. He wanted to turn around then to tell her that he was sorry the way things had turned out, that they'd turned out so badly, but instead he drove on. And as he watched her grow smaller in the mirror, he was overcome by a strange feeling, as though somehow he had betrayed her.